nice ride you got here. <laughs> oh my god. And well, welcome back to the podcast, Mark Dice. Well, it's a mo- very interesting podcast, I must admit. What time do you want to go to? Maybe we should go back to when I quit my day job, and that's kind of taking the leave of faith. Uh, June 15th, 2001. That's when I think society really started changing and the social media platforms started becoming a central focus of people's communication, the culture, and the news. From the early days of YouTube, it was like having your own television station. Oh, yeah. It was absolutely amazing. you got here <laughs> oh my god oh how was your trip you know i'm not used to anything below 70 degrees it's a little chilly out there i gotta say yeah, yeah man well welcome back to the podcast mark dice what's happening guys in yeah. the time machine now in the time machine welcome time will bend your mind it certainly will man it certainly will so i am uh Excited to have you on the show. Great to be here, dude. Yeah, this is a big deal. We've uh, this is a mo- very interesting podcast, I must admit. Uh, probably different. the most unique I've ever seen. A little different. You know, I don't do a lot of interviews. This is a very rare occurrence, you know, because that, we're friends. Yeah, I mean that's that's even more interesting is that we have a rare opportunity to hear from Mark Dice, and uh, I mean since we're in a time machine, we should probably ask you what time. Do you want to go to? I mean, was there a time in your life that you suddenly decided that I'm going to make a difference? I'm going to become an influencer. Like, what was that date? And we'll punch it into the time circuit here. We'll add that way. You know, we could go back to the early days of YouTube, but maybe we should go back to when I quit my day job, and that's kind of taking the leap of faith. Yeah. When things really got serious. Okay, so what uh, what date would you say that would be? June 2011. We gotta pick a date. It's not just gonna go to June. Uh, June 15th, 2011. Right, June 15th. Quit the old day job to become a full time YouTuber. I never looked back, but it was scary as hell. Right, let's punch <laughs> the time circuits ahead to June 15th, 2011. 2011. Over a decade ago. I'm getting old. circuits are set and now we are able to oh we've got a red light now. red lights we have to hit 88 miles an hour <laughs> I mean, you know the rules right you know the rules <laughs> you got to get the upgraded model so you can fly well that's in the works we have the upgraded model uh you know, the hover conversion Ready get, to go. get the tesla conversion you know, I always wanted to get an, an M400 Sky Car. Have you ever seen those? What's that? It's this old car I saw on TV back in the 90s where it was a concept car. It was uh, basically a flying car, like a drone. It had you know, four or six uh, rotors on it. We got a road to 80. Oh, dude. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Dude. It's a little rougher than that. You know, 
the most fuel. Economy. That's the kind of speed that'll get you a ticket. Oh yeah, I've been That'll send you to traffic school. So now here we are, June 15th, 2011, Mark. Oof. And uh, tell me about that moment. You quit your job. Like what was happening in the world in 2011? 2011, Obama was running for re-election or just about to run for re-election. Social media was just kind of becoming a central focus, I think, of everyone's lives because the social media apps came out in 2008. So that's when it went mobile from everybody's laptop to their mobile device. And that's when I think society really started changing and the social media platforms started becoming a central focus of people's communication, the culture, and the news. And so you and I both know from the early days of YouTube, it was like having your own television station. Oh yeah. It was absolutely amazing. And so I'd been building my channel up. Well, I've been doing radio. And for, for we were both time, doing radio. Yeah, we were both doing radio. We were on GCN or WTPRN. Internet we radio. Internet radio. radio. That was the thing. That was the big thing. Yep. And then when YouTube came along, I think both of us at the same time, we found it and a light bulb went off. To, this is the future. This is amazing. Okay, you know, then you couldn't even upload longer videos. It was 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. I mean, this is before you couldn't buy ring lights or webcams at staples or anything like you had to really use a camcorder and, and, and go to professional studio to get microphones and lights and things like that it was a very interesting time because only people who put the time into producing content Very knew good. you couldn't just turn on your cell phone and have a perfect camera and, and, and lighting and focus and a nice microphone it was really really interesting time but it was also the beginning of the social media revolution and the beginning of YouTubers. And, you know, back then my channel wasn't even monetized. I wasn't even part of the YouTube program. I just quit to yeah. promote my books because I had a new book that just came out, Big Brother, The Orwellian Nightmare Come True. And I just thought, you know, I I'll just write books that. and I'll figure it out, you know, but it just got so frustrating at my day job that I just, I couldn't take it. You know, I was trying to, I was writing books for a few years. I was doing guest spots on Alex Jones show every once in a while. I remember calling you on the phone and you're like, I'm at work. And it, I've known you for a very long time. So it's probably 2005 maybe? My first website was like, it was five, six, seven. You know, uh, dude, I didn't have a camcorder, a camera that had an SD card until 2012. Okay, so from the early days of YouTube, 2006 to 2012, they were available, I think they were just too expensive, I couldn't afford one. So it literally wasn't until 2012 that I had a camcorder, and that's what they were back then, with an SD card. It was literally video tape, and then I had to export it into the computer in real time. Yeah. There's no drag and drop. And it's kind of funny, you know, the older you get, you start sounding kind of like your parents or your grandparents. Like, back in my day, kids, you know, we had to drive our bikes to the Blockbuster to get me. You, you know, but that's really how it was. And it was so different. My first handheld microphone for doing man on the street interviews, I couldn't afford a wireless microphone because that was like five, six hundred bucks. It was a wired microphone. I think I probably got it like Radio Shack or something. So I'm literally walking around with a corded microphone and just getting friends of mine to come and, you know, be my cameraman we go to the beach and go to the boardwalk and I was trying to be like Jay Leno, you know, kind of my idol when I was a kid. I want to interview morons on the beach, post it on YouTube, post it on the internet. And, and then I think I started doing vlogs and reports later. At first I was just a man on the street guy and then stunts, you know, I kind of was doing weird stunts. I made a Obama sucks poster or like this custom Christmas display and hung it on a bridge over a freeway. And I unplugged the Christmas lights, you know, that the city had set up. And I plugged this thing in. I spent a lot of time and money on this, this gigantic Obama sucks banner over the freeway. So I hadn't started doing much commentary at the time. It was more or less man on the street and kind of stunts that I wanted to do or go and hang up some posters about something or. Well, I remember there's one video you you're on like a statue or you would like you would go and you would invade like college, college oh colleges, yeah colleges, and you'd have a bullhorn and you start bullhorning in a college or you'd go into a, a grocery store and pick up the mic the microphone and start blasting up oh the i did that in a barnes and noble yeah. we got three yeah, i was recommending books about uh certain things you're not supposed to talk about on youtube these days certain uh, yeah, conspiracy the modern, the facts certain conspiracy facts but you know back then it's interesting because 
YouTube always had terms of service, but you never had to worry about breaking them because we were never going to post copyrighted material, movies, TV shows, or you know, pornography or anything that would break the rules. We never had to think about our opinion or analysis of current events or elections or uh, vaccines being censored or taken down back then because nobody they weren't it was they allowed actually you free could speech actually, you could actually right. communicate freely and you didn't have to uh, self-censor you know my video on i think it was phone calls into sean Hannity's show about bohemian grove was at the time this was pre-2011 probably like 2006 was the first video about bohemian grove on youtube when you search for Bohemian Grove, it was the only video up was my, I used to call in to Sean Hattie, <laughs> show and uh, ask him about these elite oh, uh, consensus building. The radio shows. Yeah. That was a thing you did. And you would, dude, you called it culture jamming back then. And now that's a common term people use. And you would culture jam these shows. Uh, well, I would, well, if you're going to call to talk radio, what, what I did is I would tell them a bogus comment or question. They'd put you on the board. Oh, I think that Obama's doing this. Or they'd put you on the board. And then when they would go to you, then you ask your real question because they all have call screeners. They're all going to ask you, you know, a question. They want to confine the discussion to certain topics. And so I would give them some, I'd give them some pre-scripted question about some mainstream topic. And then as soon as I was live on the air, I would ask him about the Bilderberg Group or Operation Mockingbird, or, you know, these things that even today, over a decade later, still aren't part of the mainstream lexicon, but it's getting there. Candace Owens just did a episode on her podcast about Operation Mockingbird. Really? Yeah. She tweeted about it a couple times recently. So, I mean, as for everyone, a- For everyone watching right now, Mark, why don't you give us a, a basic rundown of Operation Mockingbird for the people who are uh, who need to be initiated into what exactly it is. Yeah, because you're never going to hear this on Fox News. You're not going to hear this on really any kind of mainstream podcast. Operation Mockingbird is, and the official definition is that it was a CIA program where back in the 70s, they were paying editors and writers and producers of mainstream television networks, newspapers and magazines to act as gatekeepers and propagandists for the government. And so, so the CIA was basically recruiting people from the newsrooms? Yeah. Or were they, were they, they were recruiting CIA them people and then putting them there? They were paying them under the table, like hundreds of millions of dollars at the time to function as these as gatekeepers. Now, they claimed that it was to fight communism, okay? So like any government operation, they're going to have a cover story that might even be legitimate on the surface. Okay, they have a war, I mean, it's always war, it's always because of war. I mean, look what happened after 9-11, and you got the terror, you know, the terror watch list, and you have the, you know, the TSA, everything is because we're at war. It, so, the, the, the CIA would feed, it still does, obviously, yeah. still feed these people inside tips, you know, they're, they're a source, I'm your source from within the CIA, and so we saw that all during the Trump administration, all the... Oh, a source within the Department of Defense is worried about Trump, and we got a leak within the CIA which says that he's a Russian agent and all this crap. That's Operation Mockingbird. And so they use that. And the reason that it's called Mockingbird is because a mockingbird repeats what it hears. It can mimic the tones of other birds. And one of the former uh, CIA heads at the time used to also call it the Mighty Wurlitzer, which was like, a, I think it was a... What do you call it with the with the different CDs uh, it, where you put the money in and you play it oh, at, a, at a bar? Yeah, jukebox. Okay, it was like an early jukebox. So in a sense, he called it the Mighty Wurlitzer because he could get the media to play any tune that he wanted. So let me ask you, bringing us, let's, let's jump into the future news, okay? Let's jump into the future. All right, wait for the time jump. Let's go. We're going to present day. We are in present day. Wait, here we go. <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> nice. 
take it now. We're present day. <laughs> we're talking about Operation Mockingbird. When you look across the media landscape right now, like what? I mean, you got to say, like all these. I tried to tell all- everybody back then, you know, and it's so obvious now. Everybody just doesn't know what to call it. We call it fake news now, or the deep state, but. I think that everybody should call it by the original term, Operation Mockingbird. And like any corrupt government program, when they get caught, they say that they, they're they going to stop. Oh, sorry, we, we won't do that anymore. Of course they do. It, it continues under a different name. They do it more covertly. Even the former president of CBS News said at the time that after the congressional hearings that exposed it, the church hearings since 1975, he was asked, does it still go on? He said, absolutely. He says they just have to be more... Uh, circumspect about it more. So, more but when you look at the, the the talking heads on the mainstream media today, you got the, the New York Times, you got the Washington Post, you've got, uh, I mean, uh, Washington. It's pure Washington propaganda, Times, and it, it's not just propaganda. It's it's disgusting. I would call them evil. I mean, they're not even just partisan. It's it's beyond that. They're undermining democracy. They're we're in a collapsing empire, and I don't say that hyperbolic. I mean. Financially, intellectually, patriotically, just you look at what's happening in just in the school, in the public schools, the government schools with social media sucking in the kids with the with the degeneracy and mainstream entertainment. It's like Roman Empire level collapse. You know, we've been trying to warn everybody. We saw all this 15 years ago. We have been warning people for years. I mean, specifically, if you go back and look at our old content, you could see that we were, we saw the rumblings of what was happening and we could sort of see the emerging pattern and where things were going. And we tried through the medium that we found through YouTube to just put these messages out there. And I think that's why we're so successful, not because we got picked up by some television studio who had an infrastructure and an audience and a brand. We just started posting videos yeah. on the internet, yeah. just hoping that somebody would find them yeah. and share them and subscribe for more. We never had any like backing of some big corporate entity, like you see. You know, I'm not going to you know name any big corporate conservative outlets, but you know they have huge money behind them. Sometimes question of loyalty: Are they establishment? Are they neocon? They're establishment, brand name, big money. Like, like brand GOP. Like, well, it's interesting about, I would say 2016 was the, the heyday of YouTube. Before the Orwellian Terms of Service. Oh, yeah. Before the search results started being manipulated. Before they started burying independent channels and boosting mainstream channels. And all that, of course, was the result of Donald Trump winning. And us being able to communicate, or the result of that was because... We were able to communicate and share messages and get out the word about his program and plan and agenda and expose Hillary Clinton, the Democrat establishment. And, you know, back then, we were big YouTubers then, but still weren't respected in the, you know, in, in major GOP circles because we were just YouTubers, you know? Yeah. And there were no really big names on YouTube. Now you have, and I don't mean to disrespect them, but Ted Cruz has a YouTube show. Uh, Matt Gates has a YouTube show. Uh, tons of celebrities in Hollywood all have YouTube. They never were on YouTube. It was always something that was just seen as kind of a people making home videos and just posting them online and them going viral just yeah. for fun. And we saw the potential. It was cat, cat videos. That's what they thought it was. Charlie bit my finger. Yeah. Funny cat videos, putting memento or mentos into Coke two liters and. I, funny stuff. I mean, there was a time where our YouTube channels were bigger than MSNBC, CNN, all the brand name oh, yeah. channels. Like yeah, they were so them. late to the game, you know, and now Jimmy Fallon, all these, you know, garbage entertainers are there with huge audiences, but they weren't even there in the early days. And not even just early days, like the first couple years, like Saturday Night Live was not on YouTube. Jimmy Fallon was not on YouTube. None of these guys saw the potential of it. We did. And then after Donald Trump won in 2016. Like my own channel, we got, for the, for the election, we beat the White House, Hillary Clinton, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, 
you know, and they came out in force after the election and were so upset that we had just basically kneecapped all of them. It came out of nowhere. And we, we, our message was heard, permeated, and we helped elect the president. We really did. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about that. And that's why the empire struck back. Early 2017 is when all the algorithms started changing, all the manipulation of the, ter of the terms of service and the search results. What angers me is that still today, so few people take YouTube seriously as far as being a, a, a social media network, which in a sense it is. It just it, it combines video. Are but you hungry? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. You know what? Let's go get some food real quick and then uh, pick this up on the other side of that. What do you say? Let's do it. Stop disrespecting YouTube. Uh, but you know what, my, what I was saying, though? Like, even the Republican members of Congress who finally woke up about the manipulation of big tech, they're only talking about Facebook and Twitter. Facebook and Twitter. And, you know, we're here on YouTube with huge audiences of millions of people. And if you search for any given term related to news, they bury our videos and the search results at the bottom and boost artificially. YouTube's the second biggest search engine in the world. It, you know, it is a search engine, but All you right. can't find our stuff anymore. Let's go search for some food. We're going to search for some food. I'm glad that you guys found us. If you're watching this podcast, thank you for tuning in. All right, we'll be right back. We're going to get some food. I am starving. In reverse gear. <laughs> That was a good dinner, man. All right. Whew, you got good taste. That's for sure. All right. All right. Time circuits. We're back. Um, what year are we in again? Present day? We're in the present day now, currently. Time travel, it uh, messes with your mind. It does, doesn't it, though? <laughs> Reverse gear. All right. <sighs> well, thanks for dinner, bro. Yeah, that was a good meal, right? man. That steak was something else, man. Absolutely. You missed out on the Saganaki, though. I, I did, that. dude. I forgot. Yeah, I remember. You got to get the flaming Saganaki. How much is that? That's the, like, is that like a 10 ounce slab of cheese or? It's like, when I was here on Friday, it said it was about four to six ounces. It looks massive. Well, it's cause it melts. It melts inside the, you know, the whole Saganaki. That looks yeah, it's Greek. It's a Greek cheese. I wouldn't know. Oh, dude, it looks yeah. great. I've had it before, but I should have got some. Turn right. So we were just talking about, uh, welcome back to the podcast, by the way. And uh, I got Mark Dice in the time machine. We just finished dinner. It is current, the current timeline is present day. We were just talking about uh, the search, you know, like things that surface in search results on YouTube or in, or in the internet at large, really. Like how the, all the algorithms are manipulated and how that was affecting uh, some of your search results just showing up at the bottom and everything dude if you just type in the name of any news anchor now it used to be the top video about them and if you typed in don lemon is an idiot it would be somebody <laughs> making fun of don lemon okay yeah. now it's literally all cnn's videos because yeah. they artificially boost the algorithm and well that happened in november of 2017 i remember it very distinctly because we were on fire. This was just right after the adpocalypse of March of 2017. We had noticed a 70% drop in viewership overnight. See, and they lied about it. They say that it was only breaking news. It's all news. Uh, I right? mean, I saw the statistics specifically, and we've talked about this before, and how we saw how uh, Fox and CNN, MSNBC, BBC, you know, all those channels we were beating them for years. We were beating them for years. And then the algorithm shifted. Shifted. So literally now, if you just type in anything relating to news or individuals, the top search results are all mainstream. And, you know, they've also changed them manually based off of the t search results for people in entertainment as well. So at first it was supposedly only news. Oh, we want authoritative news sources boosted. But then remember Chris Hayes from MSNBC complained about the search results for the Federal Reserve. 
being documentaries about the secret nature of the creation of the Federal Reserve, fiat currency, the whole bank cartel issue. So then they changed that. They added that to the curated list. They did it with abortion. A you know, fake journalist, a blogger over at Slate complained about the top search results for abortion. And so then they curated that. So they always do the same with Brie Larson. You know, she's an actress. She was in a movie and she was promoting her feminist. Well, who, so who points. is it that's like, it's like they seem to bow to a certain group of people who are <laughs> providing pressure to YouTube directly. They never complied when, you know, conservatives complain about not showing up. I mean, there was the one time when Crowder was making noise and, and all of a sudden, oh, uh, the, yeah. cha- the channel the channel bubble popped up at the top of search results. I remember that distinctly. Yeah, they did bury our channels just when you would even search for our names. Our, our own channels wouldn't even show up. But that's it. You know, anytime a liberal complains or you know, a fake news journalist, a self-proclaimed journalist complains about the search results about a particular topic, then, oh, just mysteriously they change. Oh, yeah. we don't like the top search results for abortion. Oh, the top videos of, are making fun of Brie Larson when you search for her name. We change those. It's just terrible. You know, for the younger generations, they should know how it used to be because now I feel sorry for them when they search for things or anybody search for oh, things. Yeah. You can't find all these. Remember all those quality documentaries that we used to watch? Oh, yeah. Even before YouTube, but then when YouTube showed up, and we used to get them on the BitTorrents, Federal Reserve documentaries, Alex Jones old documentaries, and then people started uploading those to YouTube, and you could find them. Aaron and Russell's now, freedom to fascism. Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's hard to even find those classic documentaries anymore because those key words are associated with, uh, you know, issues that they have curated results for. So do you want to do another time jump? Well, where, where do you want to go? I don't know. You're the guest. You call it. Pick a date in history or in the future. We can go into the future, remember. You know, you know, we could go. Uh, I mean, you have such insight ooh. into, you know, the way things are going now, and and you know, projecting. I mean, look, your your earliest book. We're the we're the same age, right? Yeah. We're, let's go back. Well, to look at the your late... resistance manifesto. I mean, the stuff you predicted in that. Oh, you good. know, yeah. that's the original. Two thousand five. Yeah, that's the, before even YouTube. That's the John Connor days. I did use a suit on them back then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With the sunglasses? Well, you know, I should have kept with that because now, I, you know, I kind of knew. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be visible. And yeah. now it's, yeah, I kind of ruined that, you know. So there's uh, some famous Twitch uh, video game guy who goes by Dr. Disrespect or something. And he wears like a wig and sunglasses. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. It's actually kind of smart because then you don't become recognized in the public when you're, you know, kind of out and about. Oh, I get recognized all the time. In the strangest places. It's a double-edged sword. It's kind of neat, but at the same time, it's a little unnerving. Gas um, prices. Three nineteen? No, that's got to be. With... Anyway. Um, so where do you want to go? You want to pick a date? Let's go back to two thousand five. Two thousand and five? Well, actually, let's go back to two thousand. Before we can go back to the late nineties, world before cell phones. <laughs> you know. Something there you want to talk about? Something there you want to visit? Well, I think it's just interesting, the change of society, how when we were in high school, I think two people that I in my school had cell phones, you know? Three, three people had cell phones. Well, should we hit the date then? What's the date? Uh, we could go to June of 1996. June of 96. Summer of 1996. Okay. Well, what <laughs> what day, school. though? What day? Uh, June 15th, uh, 1996. Another June 15th. Okay. Mark's got something with June 15th. There's something about that day. We don't quite know yet, but we're going to find out. Okay. We have enough fuel. In the protein in the uh, you got enough banana peels banana and peels. Mr. Fusion Mr. Fusion is loaded <laughs> all right welcome Whew. to June 1996 15, 1996 mark a world with virtually no cell phones. Yeah, the internet was like nothing. The internet was dial-up. Yeah. I had to pay. We had to pay for the internet. It was like AOL. By the hour. It was AOL, right? Yes. 
and Prodigy, I think, was another one. But uh, you know, I mean, literally, dude, the the, the kids today and young adults, I say the maybe even the you know the Zoomers definitely, maybe even the millennials, they didn't live in a world where we had to pay for the internet by the hour. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I remember getting the internet bill. And back then, everybody would get their free uh, discs and then DVDs from AOL. Oh yeah, remember how, how many junk mail? How many AOL you? discs? Hundreds you get of them. In the mail. I mean, they were like. They became coasters in my friend's house. Dude, I used to call software companies and they would send you free samples of their software on a disc because disc, even discs were expensive. Three and a half inch floppies were expensive. Oh, back. the floppies. Yeah. Especially for a kid, you know, you don't, you oh, don't yeah. make a lot of money. What was minimum wage, five bucks an hour or something back then? I used to call and get the free samples of software and then just delete it and then use the discs. <laughs> And then I didn't have to buy discs. Because like a pack of 10 discs is probably like 20 bucks or $25. Who was Mark Dice in 1996? I was kind of, I was the class clown. I was a troublemaker. Um, I was uh, a prankster. I was kicked out of high school actually, senior year. What? Yeah, technically not expelled. Expulsion's a legal proceeding. They kicked me out because of a senior prank that kind of got a little bit carried away. I don't, don't want to get into it. <laughs> we didn't do anything really like that. Wrong. I didn't especially. A senior but prank. But I was there. It was kind of my idea. We basically just like toilet papered the school uh -huh. and um, strung a bunch of beer cans up in the trees on strings and stuff like that. But it got uh -huh. carried away and some students uh, broke some ventilator ducts and all this crap uh, on the roof because we had climbed up there. But so I was kicked out. <laughs> Climbing on the roof. We did. Hanging we were on the roof of the cans. school. Oh, and, uh, Mark Dice, 1996. They told me, they're like, look, you can graduate, um, but you just can't come back on the school property for like the last couple months of school. And then I had to have my friends bring my homework home and stuff. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so literally the last two months. Because uh, it was like a culmination of things. I had been suspended previously. I had put some, uh, what you say, adult style magazines like in the library. What? And, you know, the, yeah. Like, oh, Mark Dice. Like old ones, like <laughs> that one of my friend's dads had, and I, I filled the library with a variety of, uh, yeah, you know, kind of certain material <laughs> and things. So, and, then, and I got, you know, I got suspended for that. And um, we just, I, I just a bunch of pranks, you know, and then they finally, they're like, look, just please stay away. <laughs> yeah, my, my senior year was probably just as bad i had a girlfriend at the time and and her mother she got sick with mono and her mother would call us call me in sick too and we would just hang out at her house oh. for like months i i mean i must have totally screwed i mean i didn't even graduate on time i had to go to night school to graduate but we um i remember distinctly one one time we actually reenacted ferris bueller's day off we took my red volkswagen jetta down to Chicago and we like went to the Sears Tower and we didn't go to a Cubs game but you know it was a whole like Ferris Bueller oh. Day Off feeling I mean that movie that movie ruined my <laughs> speaking brilliant, of 80s brilliant movies, movie I did like fun, like fun peaceful pranks like I, I took uh, an envelope I bought it at Spencer's Gifts and it said pregnancy test results enclosed personal and confidential oh I and remember we those, knew, those fake uh, envelopes we, we knew that these teachers were having uh, oh, uh, certain no. relationships so I sent it to her to the school to her name so that when they got it in the office it would oh. send this gigantic pregnancy test results enclosed personal you know like kind of funny just pranks type like of stuff that, like yeah. that but I just I did get suspended a couple times for um you know, putting the magazines in the library. Oh my goodness. And, and uh, just, I think like some other minor issues. <laughs> and then finally they're like, look, just just stay away, <laughs> stay away. But, uh, you know, I didn't want to know what I want to do. I wanted to do film or, you know, be a television host or do something. Yeah. And so I ended up going to college to uh, a couple different colleges, but in, in, a, in a junior college, I did a television, radio television department with like a production studio and stuff. And, we basically turned the whole class into Saturday Night Live, where like half the skits were just funny comedy. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to be like serious, 
newscasts and reports and and me and the other guys there we just literally just turned the whole thing into like our own saturday night live i still have i'm gonna start posting some of those old skits i still have the vhs i need to transfer i've got uh, if you look up gary franchi reporting the news in 1994 oh i saw you on your posted that yeah yeah. and that's that's on youtube and that was done in my television news class yeah oh that was high school then that was high school that was my sophomore year i believe I got kicked out of that class for smoking on a field trip and then lying to my teacher about it, who caught me with a cigarette in my mouth. I mean, literally, like, we had just... You can't get out of that. You know, and, like, he walked up. We were smoking outside of the Rock and Roll McDonald's in Chicago, Mr. Ferguson, and me and Todd were smoking cigarettes. We saw him coming. We dropped the cigarettes, stepped on them, and we just kept our foot on the butts. And he's like, you guys smoking out here? We're like, no, sir, no. He said, well, just be honest with me. Like, no, we weren't. We weren't smoking. He said, if you tell me the truth, then you're not going to get, you know, fired or kicked out of class. But if you lie to me, you're going to get kicked out of class for lying to me. And, of course, we lied to him, and then I got kicked out of class. And that's the extent of, that's the extent of my news broadcasting career oh. as, as far as its beginnings. We would skip lunch. We, we couldn't leave campus for lunch. So we would skip, and then we would take a piece of paper and kind of fold it up into a bunch of, you know, like a wedge. And there was one way doors that opened from the locker room out to the football field. So there was no handle, no nothing. It was locked from, you know, from the inside. So we would prop those doors open with the paper. So it was just cracked a little bit so it wouldn't latch. Uh, So we could come and then we could sneak back in and nobody would really know because you couldn't (laughs) go into any of the main entrances because then they would see you. Right. But there was that one, uh, double doors on the back that led from the locker room oh, out to the football field. Yeah. You know, also in the in the nineties, I think it was a heyday. It, it was a great time. You know, not to like reminisce and uh, and say, "Wow, back in my day." But yeah, you know, before everybody was tethered to a cell phone, and you know, back then only a handful of people had them. If you said, "Hey, we're going to be somewhere. We're going to meet at the bowling alley at eight o'clock on Friday night," you were you were there. It was consistent. It was. You'd leave the house, you know, when you were a teenager, and you didn't need to have a phone. You didn't feel like you had to communicate. You know, you, you planned yeah. in ahead. Yeah. Ahead, you you decided what you were going to do, where you were all going to meet, and and people would do that. And I think it's society's so weird now with everybody having a video camera in their pocket, and it's it's a double-edged sword. It's both good and bad. It's a tool, but I, I kind of feel sorry for the kids today that have to grow up. You know, if they're smoking a cigarette or drinking a beer and they're, you know, rapping along to a rap song that has a little word in there that hurts certain people's feelings, you know, then that can go viral on social media and and even become a national news story. You know, there was some kids at a California high school, you know, in in Calabasas, a really nice area, and they were singing along to a popular rap song and happened to use the N-word. And they posted on Snapchat or whatever. Instagram something and it went viral and oh my god look at these terrible kids they're using this terrible word you know singing along to a rap song and it literally made like national headlines because like some celebrity's uh, father or some baseball player was there or his daughter went to school there and he tweeted I just can't believe that this happened when my daughter went to school and it's like it's some kids singing along to a rap song like big deal and now well, it's a and, national and, and, news and then story. And you think about like you know people who are getting canceled in the present day over tweets they made when they were 16 years old yeah yeah like that professional baseball player i think a pitcher for the brewers or something had some tweets they went back to when he was like 14 maybe and like oh my god look at that you know he's like a 20 year old guy now and they're like you need to apologize for these tweets that you (laughs) you you didn't even remember that he made them you know like what kid doesn't say things that you definitely wouldn't want broadcast to the world. I, I just kind of feel sorry for the people growing up in society today where they got to always be on, you know, always watch what they say in the cancel culture. You can't make jokes. It's just really weird. I, I really wonder if society's going to get to the point where people finally get over jokes and just, you know, either don't laugh or don't care anymore or if we're going to go further into an Orwellian sink where People are so worried about 
offending any little group. You know, because it keeps getting worse and worse. You know, there was some uh, banjo player for a popular, I don't know, whatever you call it, kind of band that just tweeted that he was reading Andy No's book about Antifa. And then he had to ap apologize for reading a book or recommending a book about Antifa. And then they kicked him out of the band. Because, you know, it's not like he said anything racist or homophobic or whatever. He literally just recommended a book about Antifa. And they're like, oh, man. Remember that? He apologized. There was a, a there was a country singer who apologized for owning a General Lee replica. Oh, yeah. Because it has the Confederate flag on it. Like, you're apologizing for having a General Lee replica, dude? Well, I, I mean, I, I was out washing. <laughs> I was washing this car and um, the, the garbage man stopped and he's he said, hey, I, I think you'll appreciate this. I'm like, why is the garbage man coming up to me? This is weird. And he wasn't even my regular garbage guy. He was from a different company. And he came up and he showed me his phone and it was the General Lee. <laughs> and he had the General Lee. Uh, he owned He was an owner of a General Lee. And I said, that's awesome. I said, you should come out to one of these oh, car shows, you know? Nice. And he's like, oh, oh God. That's, I don't that's, know if you can hear that, but that's a uh, speed bump scraping the bottom of the car. Wow. God. Here comes another one. Jeez. If you go over it at an angle, is that going to uh, stop know. it? Maybe I don't know if it makes it worse. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Speed bumps are not my friend. Oh, man. That's the thing about driving this car, man. Well, remember how crazy stuff got. Well, he was, he was, I told him to come out to this event, and he said, well, you know, people don't like this car. Oh. People don't like this car. I don't like taking it out anymore uh -huh. because people. Oh my God! People, people start complaining about it. Yeah, he's afraid people are going to. Well, remember they pulled the they pulled the reruns from all those classic yeah. television networks. And you like couldn't even TV buy the car. You couldn't buy the car anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I own a, a mini, like you know, diecast version of that car. I bought it at like Cooter's Road Shop in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they had a life size General Lee in there. You could sit in it and. Well, remember after but the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020, they pulled cops and oh, live PD from yeah. the air because they were they portray police in too positive of a light. I yeah. mean, imagine a major network just pulls a reality show showing the dangers that these police officers put themselves in every day on the job because they thought that it was insensitive because yeah. it's showing police in a good light. Well, I remember I, I did a story on that on cops coming back to Fox Digital. Yeah, Fox Nation. Fox Nation. All, and that's that's how much stuff has changed. Not just another network yeah. picked it up. Fox Nation, the yeah. streaming service, yeah. picked up cops. Yeah. And I don't know if they're all the old ones or if they're still doing new shows, but... I think they're new shows. Are they? Yeah, they're new shows. But, I mean, like, it, how many years has it been for them to even be able to utter that program again? Yeah, it's been two, two years. Yeah. It's just crazy. You know, every time I think that society's got insane enough there's going to be a mass awakening people are going to put their foot down everybody just deep, keeps on catering and cowering and apologizing for things that aren't even offensive you know i tweeted some photos of some dog leashes that i saw in the grocery store and i tweeted it to the store to like an albert's oh i remember that tweet. and i said Third left. Ah, i was shopping and i saw these nooses you know, and I'm, and I'm triggered and all this stuff. And they apologize. They, they, and then they later deleted. They realized that I was trolling them. But, but their social media person was so, uh, you know, yeah. trained to apologize for any little thing that they took. They took it seriously. They couldn't tell whether or not it was somebody joking, or they wanted to know like what store it was at. Okay, it wasn't like oh hey. They didn't even explain like hey those are dog leashes. You know, you moron like not a noose they wanted to know what store it was so they could further investigate oh, it dude how ridiculous man how absolutely ridiculous no, well, society's Mark, gone, we, man. we got to jump to the present day now because we got to get you back to the train station you got to catch that train and um let's see let's plug in the present day here We gotta throw another banana peel and a. Uh, it looks like we have enough in there. Fusionmatic. Okay. And let's get to 88. There we go. <laughs> uh, 
don't All know right. how much time travel a human body could take in one day. I know. One day. I know. Well, thankfully, you know, the flux dispersal system, it's pretty smooth when you're going through the wormhole. You know, if you really start investigating time and like reading like Einstein's theory of time and get into uh, eternalism and presentism and like the relativityness, I, it is so mind bending. I mean, it gets so weird. I was reading a book on it. I can't remember which. Well, like time moves slower around a black hole or something like that, right? Yeah. The event horizon. You just read, Steve, if you want, you know, you're in a time, we're in a time machine. Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time will bend your mind. <laughs> It'll oh. totally bend your mind. Well, it's been quite a trip having you in the car and uh, going on this time travel adventure with you, Mark. And, uh, time flies. It does fly. It does fly. Time gets faster the older you get, I have noticed. Well, if you don't know Mark, check him out on YouTube. And uh, Mark Dice, just search him up. You'll find him. Mark and I have been at this game for a long time, waking up America, waking up the world to what's happening. And it's been an exciting and unpredictable and just wild ride all the way around. You know, navigating minefields every day. What's weird about being a YouTuber is there's no set, like, formula for job description. You know, we have to wear all these different hats, and it's such a new field where on the four, it's still, even though it's been around for 15 years, it's so weird. It was good to talk with another fellow YouTuber because it's such an odd job. <laughs> Nobody else understands what the hell's going on and the, the problems that we gotta deal with and the weirdness of the, of the YouTube world. So always great to see you, bro. All right, Mark. Thank you, sir. All right, safe travels. I'll catch you at another time. Another timeline, Mark. Pun intended. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that was Mark Dice on Back to the Podcast. Thank you for watching. It's been a wild adventure so far. Who knows who we'll have on in the future. And, um, you know, if you know me, you know where you can find me at the Next News Network. So thanks for watching. Tell your friends that uh, you went on a time travel adventure with Gary Franchi and Mark Dice. We'll see you at the next adventure for the Next News Network on Back to the Podcast. I'm Gary Franchi.